In chapter 3, we will study the fluid mechanics. And in this lecture, we will study also uh, only part A, which is the static part. First of all, we want to understand what is the fluid. We called a substance fluid when it has the ability to flow. Any substance that can flow is called a fluid. This could be applied to liquid and gases. So liquid and gases are fluids. Why we say they can flow? Because they cannot resist any shear stresses or tensile stresses. On the contrast with solids, solids are affected with shear stresses and tensile stresses. But fluids are only affected with compressive stresses. So a fluid is a substance that can flow. Mainly they are liquid or gas. We will discuss in this chapter the ideal fluids. What are ideal fluids? Ideal fluids has three assumptions. Number one, they are homogeneous fluid. Homogeneous means that doesn't change density all over its volume. So its density is constant. The assumption number two, that this fluid is incompressible. Incompressible means when you apply pressure on it, its density does not change. Number three, we will assume non-viscous fluid. Non-viscous fluids means that we neglect the viscosity of the fluid. We are neglecting any, any energy losses in the internal friction inside the fluid. To summarize this, for an ideal fluid, we can use its density constant and non-viscous. So in all our mathematical equations, we will assume that it's an ideal fluid, so the density of the fluid remains constant. And we will not put into consideration any viscosity of the fluid. Now we will uh, uh, discuss two branches of fluid mechanics. Fluid mechanics mainly are two branches. The fluid statics, when the fluid is at rest, no motion. It's at rest, not moving. And the branch number two is the fluid dynamics which means that the fluid is in motion, it is moving. Branch number one is also called hydrostatics, and branch number two is called hydrodynamics. In this lecture, we will study the first part, which is the fluid statics. Before describing how we use equations with fluid statics, we will remember the Definition of pressure. What is the pressure? The pressure is the force applied per unit perpendicular area. It's a kind of stress. It's a compressive stress. So pressure equals force divided by unit perpendicular area. Its unit is Newton per meter squared. And this is called Pascal. Pascal is the unit of pressure which is used abbreviations PA. And if you want to get the dimensions of the pressure as we did in chapter one, you will get the dimension of force and divide it with the dimension of area. It will be mLc minus two over L square, which is ml minus one C minus two. It's the same dimensions of stress. We can also calculate force by multiplying pressure and area. But take care if pressure varies over this area, we use the infinitesimal law. So dF equals P dA. Sometimes we are not concerned with pressure. We are concerned with pressure difference. So there is 
a definition of what is called gauge pressure. What is gauge pressure? Gauge pressure is the absolute pressure minus the atmospheric pressure. We will denote the atmospheric pressure with P note. P note is the atmospheric pressure or P atmosphere. It is one multiplied 10 to the power five Pascal, which is one bar. But using the SI units, we use it one multiplying 10 to the power five. So when we are dealing with pressure, we, as we are dealing with absolute pressure. This is the real pressure. But sometimes we are concerned with difference in pressure, not the real pressure. So we define the gauge pressure as pressure minus P node. Okay, after discussing some of these definitions, we want to understand how we can calculate the pressure under water. If we are at depth under the sea water or under any water, we will find that pressure will increase. As an example, if we examine this container, it's containing water. If we examine point A, it is open to the atmosphere, so its pressure is the atmospheric pressure, P no. But for a point B, at depth H, its pressure is more, according to rho G H. So in static pressure, pressure with depth or the hydrostatic pressure is P naught plus rho G H. Rho is the density of the fluid used. If we are using water, rho of water is thousand. G is the gravitational acceleration and H is the depth under the water surface. This increase in pressure is due to water. So if you are concerned with only the change of pressure or the pressure due to water, you take the difference between pressure at point B minus pressure at point A, it is rho G H. So with depth, pressure increases. Take care that all the points in the same horizontal line have the same pressure. Why? Because they are at the same depth, same H. If you take point C beside point B on the same horizontal line, it has the same depth. So its pressure will be P naught plus rho G H. It's the same as pressure P. So we say that pressure is the same for all points at the same depth, as if you are taking a horizontal line like this, same depth. And this is independent of the shape of the container. For example, if your container is like this, you take a horizontal line. Also, it, if, if it is a U-shaped container, you can take a horizontal line in the same liquid and say that it is the same pressure. So the pressure increases due to depth when it is underwater surface. Ask yourself what will happen for a point P if it is at an elevation edge. Elevation edge, this happens at high elevations like uh, mountains or the heights of aeroplanes and so on. So if you are standing on the Earth's surface, this is point A, this is the Earth's surface. So this is the Earth. And you want to get the pressure at point B, which is at height H, but high values of H, at high values of H, not two or three meters, but we are talking about uh, 2,000 meters. If you want to, to get the pressure, it is less than the atmospheric pressure, as if you are removing 
the weight of this tube of air. So, when calculating pressure at B, it is P naught minus minus rho air G H because it is less than the pressure at the Earth's surface by the value of rho air G H. Of course, rho air is a small number, so this is not effective except with high values of H. Now, after understanding what is pressure and how we calculate it and how it changes with depth and height, now we will put the rules for fluid statics. Fluid statics is that is uh, dependent on two main rules. The rule number one called the Pascal's principle, and rule number two is Archimedes' principle. Let's have a look on every one. As for Pascal's principle, Pascal said that any change in pressure which is applied to the fluid is transmitted to every point of the fluid. So if you apply pressure, it will be transmitted to the every point of the fluid and the walls of the container. As an application of Pascal principle, we use the hydraulic press. The hydraulic press, as you see in figure, consists of two pistons. This piston number one is with area A1, which is smaller than the area A2 of the second piston. Piston number one, you apply F1 on piston number one, A1. This pressure is F1 over A1, will be transmitted to the other piston as F2, A2. As Pascal stated that this is equal, so F1 over A1 equal F2 over A2. Pressure at the small piston equals the pressure at the large piston. But for different values of A1 and A2, for example, if A2 is 10 times A1, the force on the second piston will be 10 times greater. So you will apply F1, you will take it F2, the output force, 10 times the F1. The second rule in fluid statics is Archimedes principle. Archimedes said if you have an object which is totally or partially submerged in a fluid, so we have a container containing fluid and we put an object inside this fluid. This fluid will act on the object with an upward force called bion force. This bion force equals to the weight of the fluid displaced by the object. This object took the place of volume of fluid. So the fluid is pushing it upward with the weight of the displaced fluid. So we can write the bion force as Rho L V dash. This is the mass of the displaced fluid multiplied by G, which gives you the weight of the displaced fluid. Again, Archimedes said for a totally or partially submerged object in a fluid, an upward beyond force, so its direction is always upward is exerted by the fluid on the object. Its magnitude, we are trying to get its magnitude in this equation, equals to the weight of the fluid. So, it's the mass of the fluid displaced multiplied by G. I don't know the mass of the fluid displaced, but I know rho fluid V dash G. So, this will give me the weight of the fluid displaced. Again, the bion force, it's noted as B capital 
and sometimes it's noted at F and subscript B. Its direction is upward. It's always upward in the upward direction. And its magnitude equals to the weight of the fluid displaced by the object. So it is the density of the fluid. Take care, this is the density of the fluid, not the object. V dash is the immersed volume. This could be all the volume of the object if it is stated that it is totally immersed. Or it will be a fraction of the object volume if it is partially immersed. So I like you to write it through liquid V dash. And then ask yourself, is the object totally immersed? If it is totally immersed, use the volume of the object, all the volume. If it is partially immersed, use the fraction immersed under the fluid. Archimedes principle is very important and has a lot of applications. Now I want to know what will happen for an object which is completely immersed in a fluid. What will happen to it? It will suspend, float, sink. We have three cases. Let's examine what will happen. Assume that we have a completely immersed body in a fluid. This container contains a fluid. Its density is rho L. And I put an object. Its density is rho S. Totally, completely immersed in the fluid, as shown in figure. Now we have the effect of two forces. Every mass has weight, so the first force is the force of the weight downwards. So Fg, weight of the body, is mg and is directed downwards. But I don't know the mass of the object. So it's very common in this chapter that instead of using the mass, we, we use density multiplied volume. So to, rem to remind you, density symbol is rho equals mass per unit volume. So if you don't know the mass of the object, you can use its density multiplied its volume. So M of the object is rho solid, V, this is the mass of the object, multiplied by G, gravitational acceleration, to calculate the gravitational force. This, the, this is the first force acting on the body or the object. Due to the presence of this object inside the fluid, there is another force called the Bayant force. Its direction is upward and its value is rho liquid V G. Here I used all the volume of the object because it's completely immersed. This bound force is in the direction upward. Now we want to know what will happen to this object and the acceleration of this object. F net in the positive y direction will be Fb minus Fg. Substitute with Fb rho Lvg minus Fg is rho S Vg. Take common factor Vg. So we have rho L minus rho S. This is the net force. We have three cases for the net force. Case number one. If rho liquid equals rho solid, this term will give you zero. So the F net will be zero, which means that no acceleration, neither in the upward direction nor in the downward direction. 
so the object will be suspended in equilibrium position, will be static, as if it will not move with any acceleration, neither upward nor down. Case number two, if rho L is greater than rho S, this term will be positive, and of course Vg is positive, so the F net will be positive, which means that it will be in the upward direction, and the object will go upward till reaching equilibrium at floating. It will float when it reaches the equilibrium. Let's examine the third case. Third case, if rho L is less than rho S, rho L is less than rho S, the net force will be negative because this term will give negative sign and volume and G are positive. So it will be negative force. Negative force and I'm taking the positive in the upward direction, which means that it will go downward. So the object will sink. The object will sink. These are the three cases which can happen to the object if it is completely immersed in the fluid. And of course, it depends on comparing the density of the fluid and the density of the object. Now we will have some examples on the static fluid statics or the static part of our discussion. The first famous example of applying the Bion's for the Bion's force and Archimedes principle is how to calculate the percentage of an iceberg below the water surface. So we have this iceberg, it's a mountain but of ice found in the sea water, like what happened with the Titanic ship. This iceberg is floating in seawater. Floating means that part of it is under the seawater and another part is above the sea water. It's given in this problem the row of ice and the row of sea water. We want to calculate the fraction, the fraction of this iceberg that lies below the water surface, underneath the water surface. Examining this iceberg, it's under the effect of its weight downwards and another bound force upward coming from the fluid. So at equilibrium, we have sigma forces in the y axis is zero. That's why we can write the Bion's force equals mg. At equilibrium, these two forces are equal and opposite in direction. The Bion's force from Archimedes principle is rho fluid, now it's rho seawater, V dash, immersed volume g and the mass of the iceberg is the rho v of the iceberg multiplied g cancel g with g and rewrite the equation as v dash over v ice v dash over v ice equals rho ice over rho seawater Substitute with the value of rho ice and the value of rho sea water, you will find this fraction is 0.89, which is 89% of the iceberg is under the water. That's why the Titanic ship, the captain, didn't see that this iceberg is very huge. He only saw 11%, which is above the sea water, but there was 89% of the iceberg under the sea water. The second example is how to 
get the density of a body how to get the density of a body by performing a small experiment we will use a spring balance to weight a, an object in air the weight of this object is 7.84 in air then we will put the object in water and we will use the spring balance to weight it again we found that the weight is less why because the water helps me with this weight water gives me beyond force upward so now in air the spring reads all the mg but in water it reads mg minus the bion force as if the water is helping me so the weight of the body is 7.84 in air and 6.84 in water so ask yourself what's the value of the bion force the difference the difference in air it's 7.84 when I put it in water, the water is helping and is helping me in carrying this object. So the spring balance reads 6.84. The difference is the beyond force. So in air, T is the spring balance reading. It's mg, which is 7.84 newton. But in water, the reading is difference 6.84 Newton, which is mg minus the beyond force. So the beyond force is the difference between T and T dash, which is 1 Newton. Now we want to get the density of the object. Okay, from this equation, from this equation, you have... 7.84 equals mg. I write this equation again. And from this equation, the beyond force equals 1 newton. I write it again. But I know that the beyond force is rho of the fluid. Here it is water. V of the object, G. All the object is immersed. Divide these two equations, you will have 7.84 over 1 equals rho object over rho watch. And you can cancel V, G together. So rho object is 7.8 over 1 multiplied by rho water. I told you before that rho water, you have to memorize rho water is 1000 kilograms per meter cube that's how we can get meter cube that's how we can get the row of an object another example to understand archimedes principle and the buoyancy force is when using a hollow spherical shell this hollow spherical shell has a cavity inside it's hollow it's not solid so this spherical shell drawn in the figure has outer diameter d1 12 centimeters so its outer radius is 6 centimeters and we are using in meter so it's 0 0.06 meters its inner radius is unknown we want to determine its inner radius or its inner diameter. It's unknown. But when we make this experiment, we found that this hollow spherical shell is floating and half its volume is immersed. Half its volume above the water and the other half is immersed. Spherical shell of copper with an outer diameter of 12 cm floats on water with half its volume above the water surface. Determine the inner diameter of the spherical shell. The cavity inside the spherical shell is empty. I don't put anything inside. 
and this spherical shell is made of copper as mentioned here so he gives me the density of copper okay what are the forces affecting this object mg it's gravitational force downward and beyond force upward because of the fluid at equilibrium sigma sigma forces in the y directions equals zero so b minus mg equals zero or simply b equals mg now we will substitute with the b what is the b the b is the beyond force it is the row of the fluid the volume immersed multiplied by g and on the other side the weight the weight of this hollow spherical shell is the weight of copper and the weight of air inside the spherical shell we can neglect the weight of the air with respect to the weight of the copper here he's saying the cavity is empty so we have only air but the copper weight is greater than the weight of air so we will neglect this part and we will calculate the weight of the copper only now i want to calculate the weight of the copper the weight of the copper we said before it will be the density of the copper and the volume of the copper i cannot take the volume of a sphere because it's not a solid sphere it's a spherical shell hollow copper sphere so you will take the outer volume minus the inner volume to get only this volume you add the volume of copper equals 4 over 3 pi r1 cubed minus r2 cubed this is the volume of a hollow copper sphere from the other side the left side we want to calculate the, the volume displaced or the volume immersed what is immersed under water all the red volume like this half half a volume of sphere even if it is here it is air but it's also displaced by water and yani we took this volume from water this all this volume is taken from the fluid so this is the volume displaced by the object half 4 over 3 pi r1 cubed it's very important in calculating the volume of copper we calculated the volume of the hollow copper sphere but when we calculated the immersed volume or the volume displaced by the object it is half a volume of a complete sphere after substituting with volume of copper and v dash we have one equation in only one unknown which is r2 you can try to find r2 with your calculator and make sure that you will find this final answer the last example we will discuss in the static part we have a cube of wood a cube of wood which its length is 20 centimeters and it's given the density of the wood this is the density of the cube and it floats on water again floats means part of it under water and another part is above the water surface it was i want to calculate this distance the distance from the horizontal top surface of the cube to the water level i want h as shown in the figure so i will put signal forces equals zero so the beyond force equals mg as we have done before beyond force is raw water v dash g 
and the gravitational force is rho v of the cube. This gives you the mass of the cube. Multiply g. You can cancel g from both sides, and then rho water and rho cube and the volume. The volume of the whole cube is this side multiplied by the other side multiplied by the height of the cube. So the volume of the cube is L cube. What about the volume immersed under the water surface? V dash, remember this is the immersed volume of the object. It will be this side multiplied this side multiplied only this height, not the all not all the side, which is L minus H. This is the V dash. In this equation, you know the row of water is 1000 and the row of cube is 650 and the L of the cube is given 20 centimeters. It's given in the problem. So you can substitute and you have only one unknown, which is H. This is the length of the edge of the cube. The second part of the problem, I want to get the mass of lead. I will put a piece of lead on the top surface of the cube. I want to calculate the mass of the lead should be placed on the cube so that the top of the cube will be just the level of the water surface. So in number B, I have my cube and I put a piece of lead on its surface. Now the surface, the upper surface of the cube is the same level as water level. Again, I will see the forces acting on the object. This object has now two forces. Mg of the cube, the gravitational force of the cube, and Mg of the lead. This is acting down. And upward we have the bound force. So the bound force equals Mg of the cube plus Mg of the lead. In case number one, there was no lead here. So B equals Mg of the cube. After we put the lead, this is the piece of lead. Now we have another term affecting the weight we have. So you add Mg of the lead. Again, we will substitute with the bound force rho water V dash G. And for the cube, Rho V of the cube, G. And for the lead, I will leave it M lead, G. Because it's required to calculate the M lead. Now, the volume displaced or the volume immersed is all the volume of the cube. Because it's written in the problem that the top of the cube will be just the level with the water surface. So all the volume is immersed. Rho water L cubed, rho cube L cubed plus M lead. You can substitute with rho water, rho cube and L and you get M lead. Thank you for listening.